Well, good morning. It's good to be with you all today. My name's Asher. If you haven't been here before, I'm one of the staff ministers. And so for the next several weeks, I'll be um, preaching from the second book of Peter to us. And I'm excited about what is in this book and what it teaches us. So if you have a copy of God's Word, I want to encourage you to turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. I keep wanting to say 2 Peter, but 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 through 11. The word of the Lord says to us, in these words, Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all the things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and Self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord to us this morning. About three years ago, I noticed on a bookshelf a book titled Hunt for Red October by Tom Clancy. And I said, hey, I've seen that movie. And then I noticed more books by Tom Clancy, and I go, I've seen that movie, and I've seen that movie. Who would have thought that all these great movies were written by Tom Clancy? And so that started kind of this three-year period where I would pick up a a Tom Clancy novel every now and then, or now what's done, because he's no longer alive, people would write in his name and their name, so it's a part of the Tom Clancy set. And I, I love these books because at just the right time, the main character, Jack Ryan, or Jack Ryan Jr., always knows exactly what to do, whether it's through CIA training or whether it's through knowing how to fight or whether it's figuring out that his girlfriend is actually a terrorist. Jack Ryan always knows what's up. These instincts that are inside of him show themselves when the going gets tough. And I I just find it cool and awesome and it's a great escape from the reality of life. The book of 2 Peter is written to people who are facing trials all the time. Now, some of these trials look like life and death scenarios. Some of these trials look like the church being infused with false teachers. Some of these trials just look like, you know, jerks saying that Jesus isn't coming back and being rude about it or being mean about it. And what I think Peter is trying to do, especially in this first part and then later on in the books, is he's, he's trying to highlight principles or priorities or instincts that Christians ought to have when we face certain trials in life. And so today, I think he's highlighting a couple of them that we can take stock in where he's talking about when things are facing the church, you should have faith in certain ways with certain instincts. So there are a couple of things I want you to know about 2 Peter before we dive into the text. The first one is, I just want you to be aware of who wrote the book. It's written by Peter. Simeon Peter is in your text, maybe Simon Peter, it's another way to interpret that name, but either, either way, Peter is writing this book to a lot of people who he's probably written to before, facing different things within the church, and he writes to them, he says, as a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think that's interesting that, that the first thing that Peter says to people is that he comes to them, writing to them as a servant. Now, if you've read anything in the scriptures or about Peter, whether in the Gospels or in other accounts, Peter is this lion force in the New Testament. 
You know, Paul is that prosecuting attorney that no one can shake and he knows every rule in the book. Peter from time to time will look like a giant and then will sometimes kind of look like a wimp and then kind of look like a moron from time to time. But either way, he has this zealous approach that no matter where God is, he wants to follow him. He wants to follow Jesus. So whether it's the account in Mark where Jesus is walking on the water, Peter, without even thinking, just gets out of the boat and starts walking on the water too. Like I would have thought, wait wait a minute, here's a barrier. It's called ground. It doesn't have any here. Or in another place, Jesus is talking to Peter and he's saying that the devil is after him, but don't worry because he's protecting him. And he says other things in that nature. And Peter says, I would never deny you. And then not within a couple of hours, he denies Jesus, something that we have a lot in common with Peter. But he writes to the church as a servant. He also writes to the church as an apostle. Known in those days, those people who were building up the church all across the world, given given power from Jesus himself, having the mental capabilities of of being able to discern what is right and wrong. He, He calls out to them and says, I'm writing to you as an apostle of Jesus Christ. But I think it's awesome that he first says that he's a servant. Just this past week, a a U.S. administrative official resigned from his post because he's been caught up in in some scandal on maybe misusing money or maybe misusing power in certain ways. And and some of that you go, okay, that's that's recognizable. You're a public servant. These are people's taxpayer dollars. Don't, Don't misuse them. And I kept thinking, yeah, but one of the things he spent money on was a phone booth in his office. And and I would love one of those because I don't know how thick our walls are in these offices, but I talk really loud, and, and, and sometimes people around me shouldn't, shouldn't hear what I'm talking about to different people. Or maybe he was misusing, in other cases, misusing um, representatives from the office to go get him candy or food. And I thought, that sounds like a pretty good perk. Like, I, w- I would love to work for an administration like that. And then I kept thinking, all these things that he's being caught up in, he, he's just succumbing to the pressure of pleasure and of power. And I thought, man, this is what pastors get caught up in all the time, where, where we want to be known as people who have a platform with a message from us to you people. And, people, and Peter says that he's writing to them as a servant first, even though he's writing to them as an apostle. So we approach this text knowing that it is inspired by God as it's coming from Peter to the church. And just a couple of tidbits about the text. Second Peter is going to really highlight Christ in his exaltation. So high and lifted up in the heavens, whereas first Peter would would lift up Christ in his death and resurrection. Or second Peter is is much, it could much be read like a sequel to first Peter. Maybe going to the same group of people, tackling maybe a different season in the life of the church, but certainly a sequel. If 1 Peter is about hope, 2 Peter is about knowledge in the Lord, pursuing knowledge in the Lord that we'll learn from greatly this morning. And then lastly, his his whole purpose, it seems like, is pointing people to look for the coming of the Lord and to keep themselves unpolluted in the meantime. So I want you to be aware of who wrote it within the first section or the first verse. And then secondly, I want you to be aware of the purpose. Peter here is arguing for and writing about fighting for purity in doctrine. So some of the things that are facing the church that's being addressed in Second Peter is that people are accusing the apostles and the prophets and the writers of scripture and the, and the pastors of the land as making things up. These things surely are not true. You do not have to follow them. These are just old tales that old men are trying to gain power in. Or they're accusing the church as saying that Jesus is coming back, but there's no way that Jesus is coming back. It's one thing to say that he came. It's another thing to say that he rose from the grave. But now he's in heaven waiting to come back for his people? That's nonsense. And so Peter is writing to defend what he has seen and what others know to be true. So he's going for purity in doctrine. He's also going for purity in life. He's fighting against the the mantra of, you know, Jesus saved me so I can do whatever I want. You know, all that all that I want is for my own pleasure and God wants me to be happy so I can live however I wish, whether you're a pastor or someone within the church, it's up to you. What he's kind of describing here are spiritual anarchists. 
right? Anarchists, we see them on the news, hopefully not in person, where they're just destroying things in the street. And here he's giving the perspective that actually these people are coming in the church and doing the same thing spiritually. So he's fighting for purity and doctrine and purity and life. And look how he sets the table here in verse 1. Who he's writing to, he says, To those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He already is starting to set the agenda here by addressing Christians And he's trying to describe the faith that these Christians have by saying that Christians obtain their faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of God and Savior Jesus Christ. Just that sentence alone could be unpacked for months and months within sermons. But what he's calling out is that Christians have been given grace from God. We haven't earned it. There's nothing that we did that could have earned God's favor. It was was granted to us. Another way to use obtaining is received. We receive a faith from the Lord. A word implying grace, not merit. He not only says that Christians are given this faith, but that they're given this faith with equal standing of other people. And this is an apostle writing saying that these men and women have gained a faith that is equal to even him. Now, in this part, we see the growth of Peter. If you remember when we went through the book of Acts for about a year, we saw that Peter had this, had this tension inside of him where for his whole life, the Lord was exclusively saving the Jews, so he thought. And then all of a sudden, the Lord revealed to him in Acts chapter 10 that it, was, that it has always been a part of God's plan to save anyone who he wishes, and that may look like both Jew and Gentile. And so this had to work itself out almost in a way where where Paul was rebuking Peter for not emotionally or physically treating Gentile people like he should. And what's so great about this is now years later towards the end of his life, he's writing to people and saying, you've been given a faith that is equal to mine. The, The humility of this servant, the humility of this apostle who's received teaching from the Lord and is now spreading it to other people. But not only that, they didn't just receive faith or receive a faith of equal standing, but they received a faith of equal standing by the righteousness of God and Savior Jesus Christ. Righteousness is an attribute that that stems from a covenantal relationship. And in this case, we see that there was nothing that, that man or woman could do to earn the favor of God on our own, but it's only that God saved men and women for his sake by his own works. Scripturally, we see that it was Jesus who saved his people by giving up his own life because you and I have no ability to give up our lives on our own. There's nothing in us that fully should earn the respect and glory of of a holy God. Yet in our place, Jesus would stand condemned for us. And so these men and women of these churches have received the grace of God by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Doctrinally, we say that Jesus' righteousness was imputed on his people. So it was a once for all thing where, where their hearts were redeemed and made new. It, this wasn't like a, a gradual thing, you know, like in a the Major League Baseball draft happened a couple weeks ago. And what they look for is potential in guys, right? And you're watching that and you're like, yeah, I could, I could probably throw like that out of the back of a truck. And they look for these guys who have these certain capabilities. And over time, hopefully they can turn into the Derek Jeters of the world. That's not what the righteousness of God looks like when it, impu- when it imputes itself into its people. So he saves them. He gives them new life. And he gives them life that is equal to other Christians. Then look at verse 2. It says, May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God, in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So through knowledge stresses, uh, Peter stresses the means by which peace can multiply in the life of the believer. I think that's that's such a little nugget that many of us might overlook. You know, we get We get really hung up on verse 1 or really hung up on the first part of verse 2. But then we have access to God in his gifts by a knowledge of who he is. And so if you're in this room and you're not a Christian, I would just wonder, what do you know about God? What do you know about Jesus? What you know about Jesus isn't what the Bible actually says about Jesus. 
is it all that the Bible says about Jesus? You know, a lot of people think that Jesus was the greatest guy in the world. That's okay, but that doesn't save anyone. They think that he's an amazing teacher. That's okay. I watched Bill Nye the Science Guy. He's an amazing teacher too. Didn't save me. But Jesus, most importantly, is a savior. And by knowing him, by being given access to knowing him, man and woman can be saved. And so Peter is writing to these people by first setting the table, by saying, I'm addressing Christians who have been saved, not by their own doing, but by Jesus' work. And so he first wants to tell him to know their faith. So if you're using an outline provided in the bulletin, I'm now past the introduction. I'm now at number one. It's actually like my third or fourth number one, but it's the first number one in your bulletin. So there are several things that Peter wants us to know as we might be pressing towards opposition, as he's, as he's encouraging us to move onward towards the greater hope that we have in Christ. And the first one is to know your faith. Know your faith. I want you to notice the power in the gift that come from God in these texts. Look at verse 3. It says, His divine power has granted to us. Just right there. His divine power. Christ's divine power. He is divine. He is God, holy and majestic. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 says, For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, All things were created through him and for him. This is talking about Jesus, high and lifted up, fully divine. Hebrews gives another amazing picture that we can fathom forever and ever. It says that he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Just glimpse your mind at his divine power and then look at not only his power, but the gift that he gives his people. Verse 3 continues on that his divine power is granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. All things that pertain to eternal life and godliness. Christian, I don't know how often you feel like you need more of God, like a a super pack infusion, you know, like a a turbo button that you could push when the going gets tough and when life gets hard. But God says that he has given you all things for life and godliness. All things. So, So you're never wanting. You never need more than what he's given you. You can be wholly satisfied that that at your justification, when he gave you his righteousness and saving you from eternal hell, that that right there was all that you need. What a comfort this is to us, whether in facing persecution on a personal level or maybe facing attacks on a church level or maybe wondering if our missionaries overseas are okay. God has provided for them all things for their life. And growth and godliness. It's a tremendous, tremendous gift from him. And we have access to this by or through the knowledge of him. The, the power of God's gift is released to believers through our knowledge of him. This knowledge of Jesus didn't just come through you know, internal investigation or personal investigation, but because Jesus himself, remember, called us to himself. Through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. Another way to look at this or another way that people have translated this is through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Where God's glory shows his divinity and God's excellence shows his high moral character. And we see in this that the substitution of our own lives where we could not pay for our own debts in our own sin because we're just not good enough. But Jesus was excellent. His high moral character vouched for us. But not only that, but he vouched for us as the son of God, holy and divine, full of glory. His sufferings and and resulting glories gave us saving significance and also saving purpose and also salvation in its permanence. 
These are the unifying preoccupations with what the prophets and the apostles and the, and the teachers of the early church had been going after. That Jesus was divine and he gave us all things so that we are not wanting. This is truly something we could just marvel at and think about for like the rest of our lives, at least the rest of today, of how good and gracious God is compared to us. So, Christian, I would ask you, do you pursue a knowledge of God? Do you pursue a knowledge of God? Do you trust that the scripture that God has given you is sufficient for you to be able to grow in life and godliness? Are you constantly needing something else to, to add on to your life? You know, I can't pursue the Lord unless, unless the temperature is like 70 degrees, zero humidity, coffee right on the table, dog sweetly sleeping beside me. That's my quiet time. Friend, pursue the Lord in whatever context he's given you. Whether that's a lunch break at work, whether that's on an audio book, on the the audio Bible on the way to work, whether that's stopping a family dinner and say, you know what, let's just talk about all the things that the Lord has done in our lives today. And let's go to him in prayer. Or maybe even the awkward thing of praying with your wife before you go to bed. Or praying with a friend if you don't have a wife. Pursuing the Lord. Pursuing a knowledge of him. It's something that will leave us always thirsting for more, but always completely satisfied because of what he's given us. So I want you to notice that the giver and the gift, but I also want you to notice the hope that God has given us in verse four. Verse four, it says, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. I mean, again, you just read a sentence and you're like, At one level, I can't fully fathom that. At another level, I could read that over and over and over again and completely be satisfied. That the Lord would grant us promises. His precious and very great promises. Now, promises are something that when you read in the Bible, you immediately go, I want to know what that's about. You might go to a Christian bookstore and read, see titles of books that are all about God's promises or how to unlock God's promises or how to find God's promises. And here we actually don't know exactly what Peter is talking about when it comes to promises. We have allusions both within this book and then with also in other books like 1 John. So 1 John chapter 2 says, and this is the promise that he has made to us, eternal life. But we have to remember what Peter is is hoping his people understand throughout this book. That the Lord is true to what he has said he will do. And he will do it. And the promises that the Lord has given his people is that we will be eternally secure with him. So for an ever and ever, when Revelation chapter 20 talks about how we will reside with the Lord forever, that is a promise that Jesus will fulfill when he comes back for his people. But we don't just have that promise way off in the distance. We also have the security of that promise now where the one who says that he has purchased us for himself will never let us go or never lose grip of us. And so we have these promises that we can revel in and take trust in because he has granted these great promises to us. So that through them, we can become partakers of his divine nature. Now here, Peter is not implying that you and I become like gods. Or like when we pass away, as some religions say, we all get our own planets. Or we all get to become many gods. Or we all are many gods right now. What he's saying is is that we get to partake of his glory like, like a branch is to a tree. You know, the branch doesn't become the tree. But the branch is continually being fueled and fed by that tree. Or maybe some of you who have adopted a kid and you, you, you bring a child into your home and, and you give that child a bedroom and clothes and food. They're, they're partaking of the love and kindness that is overflowing within your house. And here Jesus is telling us that he is giving us certain promises, an eternal perspective, an eternal hope, a today hope but also that in the meantime, we get to partake of who he is and we get to grow deeper and deeper more like him. And we do this by, or we're allowed to do this by having escaped, verse four says, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. 
So God shows himself as a rescuer by Jesus' work where we escape sinful desire. Now, escape is not uh, escape from a world or from physical existence. You know, this isn't like Toy Story 3 where the toys are trying to outcrawl or outrun the fire that's coming in beneath them. The problem is not the world around us. The problem is actually within us. We are the problem. Our, our fleshly desires separate us from God's glory and God's righteousness. But in his kindness, he brings us to him. So in, in that action, he's snatching us away from the world that we wish upon ourselves. And he's causing us to escape our fleshly desires. This description of what Christ does to and for his sinners is, is one of the most encouraging things that we will ever read. And imagine being the people who would receive this word from Peter, whether in letter or someone would, would get up before a congregation and read it, being reminded that this apostle is telling us that our faith is like the true faith, that we, are being, that we have been purchased by Jesus for a, for a promise that he will fulfill. And so the application is this, is to make certain that this is your faith. The, the particulars of this verse, are they what you believe in? Are they what capture your heart? And maybe there are those around you who don't believe this. Are you giving effort to, to put the, the knowledge of God in front of them? And friend, if you're here and you're not a Christian, do you know this Jesus? The one who snatches us from our own sin. The one who promises us eternal life, now and forever. The one who gives us everything that we need for life and godliness. The one who doesn't keep anything from us. In all the awesome things in your life, does anything compare to that? The answer is no. And so the Lord is calling you to himself. The Lord is, is calling you like he's called people who would have received this letter, people who would have gone to this church in particular. He's calling you to know him, to know him deeply. And I hope you will. I hope you'll talk to someone about it today. I hope you'll catch me afterwards. I hope you investigate who Jesus is from the scripture. But know your faith, both Christian and non-Christian. About 25 years ago, there was a theological revolution at a really large seminary in the United States. And after overcoming theological liberalism and instituting theological clarity and biblical studies and biblical understanding of, of who God is, the, the then president of the seminary gave his first address, his first commencement address to the graduating people of that seminary. And his message was from the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where the word says, but we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord. Because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this he called you through our gospels so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Sound kind of familiar with this text, doesn't it? And then it says in verse 15, So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. The title of this president's message to the seminary was, Don't Just Do Something, Stand There. A remarkable cadence of the Christian. When, when faced with opposition, we have the opportunity and the allowance to stand on the faith that God has given us. The, the faith that cannot be removed by any force in the world. Because this is the cornerstone that may have been rejected by men, but was placed there by God himself. So Christian, as we might face turmoil outside of our realm or within it, don't just do something, stand there. But then also, don't just stand there, know something. It's one thing to stand there and look like a moron. It's another thing to stand there and know exactly who you believe in. Later on in this passage that we'll get into now, Peter doesn't just tell us to do something or stand there. He tells us, don't just stand there. But do something. So second, he encourages us to feed our faith. To feed our faith. Because God has granted us eternal life, he tells us to, as we look at the end, to feed that life with godliness. Verse 5 says, For this reason, make every effort to supplement your faith. 
to add to or supply or feed. We, we see this in Titus chapter 3, verse 14. It says, And let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. In Ephesians 5, it says, Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And then it goes on to say, And do something. He's telling us to have diligence, Peter, here in this text, or to practice our faith or to give effort towards our faith in order to build up a greater stamina or greater muscles of perseverance in times of trouble. In many ways, the Lord calls us to a sense of godliness so that other people can see who he is. You know, Christians or the church is supposed to be like a giant mirror in the city where we are reflecting God's glory to people who need it most. And here, what Jesus is telling us through the words of Peter is that by doing those godly works, we can stand on our faith more firmly. We can be more deeply rooted in who we are because of what he's done for us. So here he gives us several benchmarks, eight of them. It says, supplement your faith in chapter five, or verse five. Supplement your faith with virtue. And virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. God's power and grace are the foundation for his call of the Christian, but on top of that is also the fuel in the fire to his call of godliness that aids the Christian as they're facing turmoil. These words or these aspirations or these virtues that Peter is talking about, they, they look at us like we would look at a symphony. Where at different times, the allowances of, of different beautiful sounds are sometimes meshing together or merging together or sounding distinct. And so when you look at these, a wrong way to look at this list would be to look at the first one and go, okay, I'm going to really get my life together in faith, and then I'm going to go to virtue. Let's say 2018, faith. 2019, virtue. 2027, brotherly affection. But not until then. No, what he's saying, these aren't stepping stones, but a way to look at this would be, uh, I've heard said, like a, a spiral staircase where you're starting at faith and you're going towards love as Christ's virtues always were. And as you're going up, you're, you're hitting different marks and learning different marks and growing in different marks. And for the Christian, this is an encouraging list because he doesn't say that this has to be mastered by the time you hit 35 years old or you're never going to be a good witness to anyone and you're probably going to die. But he says, grow in these things. Supplement your faith with these things because they will bring you not only encouragement, but courage. So just to highlight a couple of them, when he says to grow in knowledge, what's implied here is growing in the use of the mind for the outcome of comfort and assurance. It's one thing, and congratulations if you ever won Bible drill, but if it doesn't bring you more courage and encouragement and persistence in pursuing the Lord, that's just knowledge. And here he's talking about knowledge in pursuing the Lord. Or growing in self-control, Culturally, this would be written to people who would understand self-control in the, in the realm of athletics. So you, you act a certain way when you're a superior athlete. You don't eat ice cream right before the Super Bowl. You know, you just have a lot of Gatorade or, or you make sure you get a good night's sleep. You have self-control versus those fleshly desires. But as a, as a church and as Christians, we're called to not give into our fleshly desires, restraining from those desires because they are incredibly strong, whether they are, they are sexual desires or gluttonous desires or prideful desires. He's calling us to a high, to look at the one who was perfect over all of his fleshly desires. That is Jesus. And he's calling us to abstain or to show self-control, not giving in to those things. And by doing this, we're totally dependent on the Lord. I mean, how many of you have, have ever been in a situation where, where if no one was around, you would have really let loose? Because that would have been the fleshly thing to do. And here he's saying that pursuing the Lord rather than pursuing our flesh is what we ought to aim for. And we should grow in that more and more. Grow in steadfastness and in perseverance grow in godliness, being a disciple or growing more like Jesus, who he was and how he lives and who he is, living in light of the cross. Peter mentions Noah later in chapter two. He mentions Lot in the next chapter. 
of being godly people, that in their living within a sinful world, they had godliness in mind. The full character of God is what they were aiming after. And here Peter is telling us that the best way to fight the end is to grow in these things. And the last two are brotherly affection and love. Notice that when we show brotherly affection and love, we fulfill the the Ten Commandments in total. That we should love the Lord our God with all of our heart, and all of our soul, and with all of our mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. And not just people within the church, but also unbelievers outside of the church. God is love, writes John in 1 John. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. Love which Peter mentions in this text as a last characteristic in a series of virtues is the fruit of faith in God. So we see these as things that we should take stock in and aim for. And by by looking at this list, we are shown many things. We're reminded of, of who Christ is in being the embodiment of all godly virtues. Remember, he's glorious and excellent. We're, we're reminded not only of his glory, but we're reminded of his kindness and in, in his grace in saving us and fueling us so that we can pursue those godly attributes and those godly virtues. So we're reminded of how great and awesome and powerful God is, and we're marveling and amazed that he would use people like us to shine his light to the world by pursuing godliness or self-control or knowledge of him. This shows us our dependence on him. This shows us what true change looks like. I'm reminded of an example that I heard from a preacher years ago. It had to been 20, 25 years ago. I was super young. And someone was really frustrated, one of those like Q&A with the pastor. Someone was really frustrated that they, that they can't overcome sinfulness. And, they, and, she, and she asked, will I ever be sinless in this life? And the pastor said, no, you won't ever be totally sinless, but you will hate it more. You'll be so in love with the Savior and so overcome with his grace that when we naturally mess up or when we're given over to our flesh, Oh, we're so sad because of who the Lord is. And so we keep working and working and working and growing and growing and growing. And then last, through the reasoning of this general list, we have this call and direction to supplement our faith with holy aspiration ending in love. So Peter is encouraging his people and us to grow in knowledge of God, to fight off instability, What Peter is revealing to his people is that our unwavering and increasing confidence in God's glory and in God's excellence is an outflow of the knowledge of Christ who called us. What we do should flow from who we are. What we do as Christians should be an outflow of what God has done in us. He has separated us and made us new, and he's allowing us to act like it. So then third and finally, he tells us to practice our faith. In verse 8 it says, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing. So he's calling us to aim for growth, for positive growth, for, for an upward trajectory. Growing in these qualities is a good thing. 1 Corinthians 15 says, therefore my beloved brothers be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Our soul's growth results from growing in our knowledge of God. So we should be aiming for that growth. That these qualities are not just ours now, but they are abounding or growing or increasing. Because it would be a sad thing if they were ineffective. Because if you're doing these things, that keeps you from being ineffective or it keeps you from being unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord and Jesus Christ. The Bible uses agricultural terms all the time, which is frustrating because I I did not grow up around much agriculture stuff. But I have seen a barn with a broken tractor behind it. And, And what a waste that tractor is. It's just taking up space on that farm. Like, I don't know what could happen back there behind the barn. Something could go back there like a cow or, you know, a milking thing or whatever. But it's just useless and taking up space. And what woe is us. If we have been given all that we need for life and godliness, and we do not pursue him in godliness, it's not that we're incapable, it's that we're unwilling. 
or even worse, were unfruitful. What, a, what an unfruitful tree can do to a crop or what weeds can do to a field. He tells us to aim for sight and not for blindness because by doing those things in the negative, it would be like you being nearsighted or blind, even worse, having forgotten that you were cleansed from your former sins. So we have here almost a, almost a, a halftime pep talk where if we find ourselves not growing in godliness, not growing in grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, he's calling us to remember what we have been saved from because by being reminded of what we have been saved from, we remember who saved us and we remember how he saved us and we remember that we actually didn't do anything for ourselves and that he gave us everything and he supplies us with everything that we need. And then in verse 10, it says, Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. He tells them to aim for diligence and to confirm the faith that they had. And then he lastly tells them to aim for heaven. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm reminded of a story of hundreds of years ago where a man was being sold at an auction as a slave. And the price on him kept going up and up and up. And up and up and up. He must have been just a a great specimen for what everyone wanted from him. And there was this one man who, no matter what other people were bidding, he was, he was always going higher and always going higher and always going higher until he won. And then he went over to the table where you would pay for a person like this in this way, and he said, now how much money would it cost to set him free? And he paid what it took to set him free. And when the man found out after being unchained, that he had been released and given freedom forever, he just started following the man who had not only bought him but sent him free. And everyone was like, what are you doing? You don't understand the concept of this. Go somewhere else. And he remarked to the newspaper man, if that man did what it took to set me free, I can't imagine what it would be like to live with him. For the Lord has called us out of darkness and death and hell that we all deserve. And what's in our heart is not just meant to stay there, but it's meant to be a light to the world and encouragement to us. He encourages these people who would read this letter to keep their eyes on heaven because there will be an entrance into heaven where it seems like people are going to be excited that they're there. Through trial and turmoil and frustration and all the oppressions of the world, we're called to keep our eyes of where Christ is. Christ is ruling and reigning, and he is kind and good. So we might march towards the hills of Zion because that is where true rest is. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you this morning grateful for what you have done. We're amazed at what you have done. We're overwhelmed that you've done it for us, your people, and we are grateful for your faithfulness to not only do that, but that to see us through this life to be with you forever and ever. Lord, we pray for the courage and the stamina and the ability that can only come from you to live out a life that reflects the life and godliness that you have imputed to us and that we are partakers of. And so we pray, Lord, that you would guide us and gift us like you have. And may we respond in joy and in diligence for your glory. Amen.